Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I, would, I have gotten a bunch of questions from some of you asking about a video I did where I mentioned the term guard. And I do run a guard in my network, and so you asked me to do a video on what is a guard? What is this thing? So I'm going to talk a little bit about that today, so if, stick around. Uh, I think you'll find this interesting. There, there's no way to escape talking about a guard without first talking about multi-level security because MLS is the basis for why we have guard. Why do we need one of these things? Well, in the past, we have different security domains. Now, when I worked for IBM, they had, I don't know if they still do, but they had three domains that they considered security. They had their red domain, which was the uh, internet, which would have been untrusted, they had, and that included the DMZ. They had their uh, corporate network, which was used by us, the employees, which was called their <laughs> blue network. And then they had their green network, which was totally disassociated from all the others. It was a standalone. You had ports in the wall that you had to connect to in order to get access to it, and that was IBM's internal financials. All the accounts receivable, accounts payable, general ledger, payroll, everything was over there. So, so yeah, and if you, in order to set up those traditional security domains, and IBM did this too, they, they had to replicate all of the things that they needed for each of the domains. They had to replicate switches, they had to replicate firewalls, they had to replicate something that would move data between them. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it, uh, it was a, it's, a, it's a complicated thing and it, it means you have to move storage and computing devices and networks and you have to duplicate all those things. And there is, they had a sort of a primitive guard, but the only thing the guard did was it helped move, one, move data from one security domain to another. It was expensive, it was time consuming, and it was a waste of resources because a lot of times most of those resources sat idle. That's never a good thing. MLS was really the first operating system to attempt multi-level security. Now, we're gonna talk about multi-level, so don't worry about that, but, <laughs> uh, and Multix, as you can see from their logo, actually had multiple rings. So each ring in that logo was a security level with the kernel or Multix at the center occupying the very highest, most secured part of the system. And users would only have access to a particular ring based on their level of access or their security. Yeah, the Air Force, the US Air Force hacked it. Uh, they <laughs> successfully cracked the thing. And, uh, and so MIT, which was the host sponsor for this uh, project along with Honeywell and Bull and Bell Labs originally um, and several other and GE and some of them they were all involved with developing Multics so and Multics development went on into the into the uh, 21st century I mean it it was actively being developed for quite a while but we're not here to talk about Multics we're here to talk about MLS so what, what about multi-level security <laughs> what is this thing so you might hear some people say MLS, it doesn't exist. It's an overloaded term, it's stupid, it doesn't work. The truth is, not only does, has MLS been defined, it is defined very, very succinctly, by the way, and it has been defined since the 1970s. There have been products that have been built and accredited to, uh, as MLS, and products continue to be built and accredited today as MLS. So. Yeah, I mean, it's based on many models. I mean, originally it was based on on two, uh, two very primitive models, and we'll kind of talk about those. I'm not going to get into all of, the, all of the esoteric things about how it was built up and how it evolved because we'd be here until Friday afternoon. So, um, so the, the, the thing to remember about MLS is it requires mandatory access controls in order to function properly. Now, this diagram I have up here 
is not showing you everything. It's just a functional architecture diagram where I have four security domains that a user is allowed to, to access. If they are at any one of those, if I'm a security level A domain user, I can't see the other three. Uh, if, if I'm a C level security domain user, I can see A, B, and C, but not D. So that's a very complex thing. And so let's let's dive in a little bit different, a little bit deeply. So MLS means that there's a single entity which stores the data marked in such a way as to identify its classification. In other words, that, dable, that data has some kind of label associated with it that identifies that particular piece of data. It could even be a record in a database. So yeah, you could get that fine grained with it that you actually have records in the database that are marked as being in domain D or marked as being in domain A. But the it goes a little bit further than that because applications and algorithms and processes can also be marked by the classification. So you not only are protecting the data, you may be protecting access to sensitive algorithms that you have developed that you don't want exposed. And maybe they're uh, intellectual property, maybe they're uh, maybe their internal in, in, uh, research and things that <clears throat> you don't want to share with the outside world. So even the transport of the data and the applications, the computing devices, that also can be marked as part of the classification. So I can have networks that are associated with D domain, which don't, which don't allow access from users which have classifications in the A domain. So. Yeah, I mean, they prevent uh, data and applications of traversing lower security infrastructure. So you obviously you wouldn't want that. In other words, a, a domain does data application, which which domain does data and applications and algorithms and processes and networks, where, who, where do they belong? Who do they belong to? The ba most basic of the MLS models says this, higher security levels can read from lower levels but they're not allowed to write to them. So in other words, uh, a user that's in a domain D, for example, he can, that person can read from C, B, and A, but they're not allowed to write to them because the problem that you might have is you might be spilling data, which is in domain D, into those other domains. So write is disabled, but you are allowed to read from those areas. Uh, and, 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 con and in contrast, lower levels are not allowed to read from higher security levels, but they are allowed or might be allowed to uh, write to them. So, and that would be a way to move data from lower security levels to higher security levels because that is consistent with users on the higher levels are able to see data on the lower. So that's the real simple model. There's more to it, a lot more to it than that. I'm just telling you, this is what we're interested in today. There are other rules and policies that come into play for multi-level security, depending upon the needs of the organization. So a guard has to come into play to move data from one security level domain to another. In other words, uh, a guard is responsible for the integrity of the domain that it is passing this data to. You wouldn't want to pass malware from a lower level domain to a higher level domain that might risk uh, that particular domain's integrity. So yeah, you wouldn't want that to happen and you wouldn't want to allow something to modify either the applications or the data that's on higher level. So that's the other reason why a guard is deployed. Uh, as well as being able to generally block uh, and, and enforce the mandatory access. A guard may downgrade higher security data to a lower security data uh, security level by removing or redacting parts of the data that which are sensitive. That is, um, there may be pieces of the data you can bring down and pieces of the data you can't. So yeah, I mean, uh, that would be a redaction, a partial redaction of the information that's in those files. Uh, before it's allowed to come down. So this downgrade process can be manual, that is it can be a human review. In other words, I push this file on somewhere on the 
let's say I'm moving uh, something from the B domain to the A domain. So I would push that file to a folder that the human reviewer would have access to and then notify that reviewer that, hey, there's a document here for you to review. They would then go through and manually redact the portions of that document that they didn't want to have distributed to the A domain. So that means you have to have very well-trained people that are involved in that in order to be able to make sure that the appropriate data is released and not uh, an accidental uh, leak of information that would have been on the high side or the higher sides of the network. The other one is it can also be machine assisted. There is, there are algorithms which, and there there's some of them that use AI and there's some of them that use just a whole series of rules to determine what to look for in a doc. I know this is uh, to oversimplify things. MLS is designed to deliver the right data to the right person at the right time. And by the way, time is another factor in MLS. And, and there is a time component, and the reason for that is in classification systems, there is a lifespan. So if I classify something at, let's say, the C domain level, I would, I would have to specify a date at to, as to when that expires. Now, what happens to it when it expires is dependent upon the rules of your particular organization. So let's say that it's 10 years old, that data may be expired to be destroyed, or it may be expired to be released into the public domain. So, yeah, I mean, I mean it's, it, it depends on the policies of the organization and what they intend to do. So things like financial data, for example, probably are expunged after seven years or archived or removed off the system altogether. So, yeah, I mean, a time component is used to expire that classification. A, a person with property security clearance can see data at or below the level of clearance. So we've talked about that. However, the higher system can't leak information about even its existence. So, for example, let's say I'm a user on the A level and I'm accessing some, attempting to access a file that exists on the B level. So, if my system turned around like in a typical Linux environment and it said access to file XYZ is denied, that would indicate that that file existed and I would be leaking information about its existence. So this exposes the existence of the file and that would be considered breakage. So yeah, I mean that you cannot even acknowledge. It has to file silently. It has to be quiet. It has to just act like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about and just let it go. It can't say, you know, the file's denied, the file doesn't exist. That kind of, it can't, yeah, it can't even acknowledge that anything is there. There are some obfuscation techniques that were used years ago, like you might tell it that, you know, you have, uh, maybe you have baby buggies that are stored in this particular domain. And, and but the problem is, is that somebody eventually is going to be looking for baby buggy, buggies and they're going to think there's one there and there's not. <laughs> so again, you have a spill. Of, of data integrity there because you're exposing information that you're you're masquerading that uh, what that file system represents. So, uh, so what about this? Tr what about trusted computing? That that always seems to come up whenever we talk about multi-level security. There are ways to implement MLS, and one of them is to use trusted operating systems. That doesn't mean that the operating system is one that you trust. It means an operating system that is designed for trusted computing. And there are rules and there are labels and there are things that exist. Uh, you can go look at the PCI spec. You can go look at HIPAA. You can go look at a lot of different specifications for security. And you will see clear markers on how these things are defined. Sun developed one a long time ago. It was called Trusted Solaris. It's still around. It's called the uh, Solaris Trusted Extensions today. And it has uh, the ability to cr uh, label uh, data. It even goes as far as protecting the Oracle database. There are labels even within inside the uh, data records inside of Oracle. So um, the problem with it was it was very complex. It required a lot of maintenance. It was slow. Yeah, it was slow, and as all security things are. So I haven't seen one yet that speeds things up. Many people just decided it wasn't worth the trouble and they just went to less trustworthy systems 
like Microsoft Windows, for example. I'm not picking on Windows, so you know, it's just that when you're talking about this level of trust versus what Microsoft Vista called trust, it's not the same thing. What about research that's going on in multi-level security? What what what, do you, what is going on with it right now to kind of make things easier? Well, one of the things that's going on is this thing called multiple independent la la levels of security, or MILS. And MILS has a layered architecture that is used to enforce information flow and provide data isolation security policies. So basically what it is, is it is a, uh, a real-time operating system that sits at the bottom that provides separation. And then on top of it, there's a number of managers that run, like the council manager, there's a token service driver, a file system driver, blah, blah, blah. But the real core of it is over to the right, which is the guest OS middleware. And then you have the applications on top of it. Those applications are actually siloed inside a virtual machine. So, yeah, you have your security levels on each one of those SL. So you might have a domain A, domain B, domain C, for example, running on that box. And the separation is provided through the kernel and the services where none of the data is allowed to traverse. Now, has this been accredited? Not to my knowledge. I think they're working on it. Um, uh, I don't know. I've been away from it for a while, so uh, maybe you guys know more than I do in this in this particular junction. There, there is a commercial. If you're looking for a separation kernel that exists today, there is one, and it's offered by Green Hill Software, and it's called Integrity Separation Kernel. All right, that brings us to the guard. So, what is the guard? What is this thing? This this thing. So, whenever you have multiple domains you have security policies that have to be validated on every single piece of data that moves in and out of each single level domain. So anytime I'm sending data to the B domain or the C domain, I, I have to have something that's going to validate, does this really go here or does it need to go somewhere else? Because I don't know. I mean, without if I don't look at anything, it's going to go to wherever the default switch is pointed to, right? So I need, to, I need to have something that's going to say, oh, this data goes here, this data goes there, this data... I don't know what to do with. I'm going to have a human figure that out, or I'm because it's unmarked, for example, and that does happen. Um, and it really it does happen more often than you would think. Um, so this thing is checking policies that, and it must be trusted. It ha in other words, you may hear this thing called a trusted guard. You might hear it called a high assurance guard. You might just hear it called a guard, which is what I call it. Um, so it performs really three functions. It provides network separation, not kernel separation, but network separation. Uh, it also provides uh, mandatory access control enforcement and data validation, which is what we had talked about. There's other things they do, but that's really the primary things it should do. So network separation, you cannot use VLANs in guards. No, <laughs> you can't. VLANs are great for management. They're not security apparatuses. So they have to. They require physical interfaces in order to work. Uh, there's a high side network interface that goes to domain C, and that has its own IP address that it gets from the high side. There's also one on the low side which goes to domain B, and that one also gets an IP address that's on on B. And there is no flow of data between them unless it goes through its guard function. So the firewall rules are set to closed. No, no data passes to any one of those unless it is marked for that network. You cannot pass data unless it's marked. So there is an entity that is physically picking that data up and putting it onto the IP uh, circuit for the C domain when it belongs to the C domain. So yeah, that, and it enforces the source destination IP via a firewall mechanism, and I can tell you, and an application as well. They, they go hand in hand. There are mandatory access controls, uh, and that is the trusted operating systems such as trusted Solaris is required to meet MAC requirements. Now, that has lifted somewhat. Uh, there, there are there are guards that run Linux today, uh, and there is guard software that is in the open source. By the way, there's some of it that's in the open source. If you're interested in that. I can come back and do a and do a more in-depth tutorial on this, but 
Yeah, there is open source software that does guard function. Uh, but it is very rudimentary. I will tell you, warn you that right up the front. So, yeah, if you're looking for all the things we're talking about today, it probably doesn't exist in that. A trusted operating system, the operating system carries label information on all components on the system, such as memory, file, systems, network interfaces. So everything is protected. So, yeah, I mean... <laughs> These are probably some of the most complex pieces of software that I have ever encountered. Uh, they do provide APIs for systems such as other guards to move data between security levels. So if you're it, moving it up is trivial in most places, uh, it's moving it down that becomes a bit more work. Data validation, when data is passed from high to low, uh, data validation ensures that only the data authorized at the lower network security level can be passed. So you can have Data that's marked for the B domain ex exists on the C domain. That's possible. So uh, if you've encountered that and it has not been modified, then that data, and you have to ensure that that data hasn't been modified. In other words, somebody hasn't inadvertently gone in and added C level uh, data to it, <clears throat> that it can go back down onto the B domain, usually without a human review as long as it's been validated not to have changed. Now, if it's changed, it usually has to go through some review process to have that happen. So there's several options that exist for performing the check. You can, you can use classification rules to independently interrogate the data and determine the classification that the data has. Uh, you can ex verify the existing labels on the data, and you can verify this digital signature on the data provided. Now, I can tell you that today, in most cases, digital signatures are required on most things. You might conclude that a guard is a firewall. Well, you'd be wrong. That's not, no, it's not a, just a firewall. <laughs> uh, it's a lot more than that because it has services that provide the check on incoming files for malware and viruses, for example. You wouldn't want malware and viruses to escape out of a lower level onto a higher level security domain. Uh, that would be somebody's job. Um, it also provides services to perform both manual human and automated machine reviews where it can. Usually what happens is, uh, at least in my experience, the automated review will happen first. If it fails, it goes over to a human review. If the automated review, if the person that's downgrading it knows that the file is gonna require a human review, they mark it as such and, and it just bypasses the, the machine check. Uh, there's other functions such as protected streams, so you can have multiple streams of data, video, for example, coming out that are protected. There are checks for the digital signatures. There may also be checks for digital handshakes before the data is even permitted to, to move in either direction. And there's logging that occurs on every file or every operation that this thing does. So you might then con conclude, oh, so a guard is SE Linux. I saw on Red Hat's uh, documentation page, they implement MLS using SE Linux. Well, uh, yes, they do have a document that says that, but I'm telling you, though, that would not implement SL MLS. Um, yeah, a guard has to have mandatory access controls in it, which is true. Yeah, you will, you can definitely do mandatory access controls with SE Linux. Uh, however, you also need to check that the incoming files don't have malware and viruses, which it, SE Linux doesn't do. And you also need per, services to perform manual reviews when they're being downgraded. And you need other functions, such as protected streams, digital signatures, logging, which SE Linux isn't going to do for you. So I'm going to leave you with a couple of quotes that I've heard over the years. One of them is, I always think that uh, no companies have spent more on coffee than they did on IT security. Uh, if you spend more on coffee than you do IT security, you will be hacked. Yeah, you will be hacked. Uh, someone cracked my password. Now I need to rename my cat. The most famous of all was, now nah, I'm not worried about IT security. I store my data so disorganized I'll never find anything. Anyway, that's that's all I had for today. Uh, just trying to give you some idea of what a guard is. Uh, I, I mean, if you want to know more about it, there's plenty of stuff that's in the CISSP uh, materials on, on MLS. So if you start headed down that road, you'll encounter probably 10 or 15 different models uh, that are used in that space today. You may even encounter some of the research that's going on today. 
So that's all I had. But I hope this helped you. And if it did, please like and subscribe. Hope to see you all in the next video. And bye for now.